It is muggy, Rebecca. You're not kidding. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. I think we've got a nice uh, group that uh, is joining in this morning. Oh, we've got a few that'll that'll be trickling in uh, from this point forward. But I want to welcome everyone to the latest uh, DHCD Creating Community Vitality series focused on food and small-scale production. We're flipping the model on economic development and focusing on action now. This is stuff that you all love. So that's some of these action-oriented ideas. So speaking of those ideas, uh, we will notify the first 20 registrants shortly after this live event that they will soon receive a copy of Ilana's book, Recast Your City, How to Save Your Downtown with Small-Scale Manufacturing. So look out for that e email soon. I'm Kyle Meyer with DHCD's Community Revitalization Office, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. I'm on the right screen here. A little housekeeping as usual before we get started. To reduce background noise and distraction, please mute yourself and optionally, optionally turn off your camera. That provides a show for sharper focus to our speaker. Uh, so uh, look for the little microphone and camera at the bottom center of your browser window. So far I can tell that you all get this and are probably familiar with Google Meet. We are recording the webinar and shortly after, uh, the recording and presentation handout will be posted on virginiamainstreet.com. I usually get this done within the next 24 hours, so look out for it if you want to snag that. Uh, there will be a Q&A opportunity at the, the end, so please use the chat feature to ask questions. Nevertheless, feel free to enter your questions in chat at any point, and we'll definitely note them um, and have them queued up for uh, that conversation after the presentation. So find that chat feature in the bottom right corner of your browser. It's that little thought bubble um, next to the geometric shapes and uh, the little people. So speaking of chat, let's test your skills. What are you all hoping? So I'm going to ask you a question, and I hope that you guys can throw in a few answers on this, because I think Alana and myself might be uh, very curious to hear what you think about this. But what are you hoping to get out of this webinar today, and, and what are you hoping to learn? So if you take a minute just to throw in some of the, that input, we'd love to hear about it. Well, something I hope, my goodness. Tune in. Oh yeah, what's next post pandemic? I hear you. And I think Alana has some great ideas queued up about that. Looking for inspiration for some of our vacant space. I think you're right on target. I think Alana looks like, yeah, got that in here. How we elevate small scale production as an economic development strategy for Virginia. Yes, indeed, and help available um, uh, to uh, help available to nonprofits to start growing for food security nicely, sure, and addressing food deserts and food insecurity, nice. Anything else? I think you guys are at the right webinar, is what I'm guessing. How can we support small scale producers? What resources do they need? Good. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm so glad to, to hear that you guys are tuned into this topic and are ready to learn something a little new. Ooh, of course, I move around my screen. So this is the seventh installment of DHCD's Creating Community Vitality series. And this monthly series intent is to provide inspiration ideas and resources to help position your community for success by ensuring local amenities infrastructure and social offerings are in place to retain and attract an increasingly mobile workforce. The series is organized around three key themes, identity, recognizing your community's core strengths around place, people, and the leadership pipeline, ecosystems, exploring the systems that support successful business startup, tourism, housing, and worldwide connectivity, and community, Strengthening public spaces that encourage interaction, inviting cultural events that celebrate local foods and history, and involving everyone to affect change. 
the topics are spread throughout the year are reinforced through DHCD's Partners for Better Communities podcast and Virginia Main Street blog posts. So go to virginiamainstreet.com to learn about what's upcoming and access some of those podcasts. All right, so in today's webinar, you will learn about how to build a strong and resilient economy, including why and how to focus on small scale manufacturing businesses and how new real estate models for downtown can be essential to your success. Our speaker is Alana Proust, founder and CEO of Recast City and author of the brand new book, Recast Your City, How to Save Your Downtown with Small Scale Manufacturing. Through Recast City, Alana works with local leaders to bring Main Street back to life, bring businesses back to downtown, and build an inclusive and resilient economy. So welcome, Alana. So, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing and ask you to bring up your first slide, and then I have a few questions to ask so that our audience can learn a little bit more about you. So just let me know when you're ready. So I, it says you're presenting, here we and go. There we go. I'm coming. <laughs> okay, you see everything? I do, perfect, I love it, without a hitch. Technology. All right, so we know a little bit about what you do, but I think we need to dive in a little bit more and, and learn more about you. So here are a few questions. Some are a little fun, some are definitely career oriented. Okay. What is the career highlight that you are most proud of? Wow, um, I have to say it's the book. So the book is really a culmination of, oh, you know, my entire many decades in the field. Um, it is, uh, in some ways an expression of my belief in the power of places and in the people in our communities to make them great. And so uh, the that book coming out live um, and everything from just seeing it in print in front of me, I actually don't have a copy right next to me right now, which is unusual, um, to being able to get a cake that looks like the cover of the book and, and hold it up with the book. Um, it's been really exciting. And um, one of the things that's been so um, touching is getting messages from people on LinkedIn who I've never met before who are finding their way to my book through their economic development or their planning fields and finding that it speaks to them and the work that they they see that they need to do in their community. So that's definitely a highlight. Absolutely. And I know there's a lot of passion behind it and it's been a long time coming. So uh, I can't wait to dive in myself. So how, how has your perspective on the world changed over time? And this might be a really big one that might be a little bit more localized to the past year and a half or just something that uh, has come to mind as or changed as, as you've moved through your career. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I worked in the fields of community development and smart growth and downtown reinvestment for a very long time. And I worked on housing choices and transportation choices way before it was, you know, sort of the last decade when everybody was talking about it. Um, and I, I think that the thing that I've realized um, over the last bunch of years, but sort of has become so stark and clear really through the pandemic is how um, disparate our impacts are so that we know that there's um, a history of systemic racism in our economic development and in our planning fields. Um, there's a, a bias in many cases against investing in rural communities um, and their local economies. And just recognizing the biases in our systems and the, the decision making historically that we've made and really trying to be very proactive and being purposeful about who we talk to, about the outcomes we're working to achieve and about thinking very critically about who we wanna benefit from the work that we're doing. And I think that if anything coming out of the pandemic, we have even more responsibility to look at the way we do our work with a critical eye towards being purposeful like that. Yeah, yeah, and I love that message about purpo being purpose-driven. So essential to have that why um, when doing the planning and even di diving into the motivation of getting the work done. So thank Absolutely. you for that. Yeah. All right, now, the last one's a little bit more fun. Uh, learn a little bit about you personally. What is your favorite way to spend a day off? Oh, wow. Um, definitely with family, often cooking uh, with my kids. They're, they're bigger than I am, so they're not little people. Um, listening to 80s music uh, or taking a hike with my dog uh, and getting out there and, and just being outside. Absolutely. I can concur. I'm in on that. All right. Well, Alana, I'm, I'm, I, the, the reins are all yours, so I can't wait to hear what you have to say. So thank you so much for being here today. 
Thank you Take so much away. for hosting me. Thank you. And right. I'm excited to be here with everybody today. Um, as as we said at the beginning, you know, if, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat at any point during the conversation today. And I promise we'll get to all of them or as many of them as we can. Uh, I really want to make sure that we're leaving enough time for questions that you have, because I, I know that you all are thinking about this in different ways within your own work. And I want to make sure we can get into the details. What I'm going to do is first give you sort of an overview of where I think we are um, and hoping that the technology will in fact let me do that. So first I want to say hello. Thank you for hosting me today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I just want to ground us a little bit in what I'm talking about, right? When I'm talking about pro product businesses or food businesses, um, ultimately I'm really talking about the businesses that we put into our storefronts, um, the businesses that we put on our main streets um, that express the personality of our community, of the place and of the people in our community. Unfortunately, we know historically that there's been a neglect also in some of our main streets and some of our buildings, um, leaving a lot of vacancies over time, but even more so this past year because of the pandemic. Really seeing the struggle in a lot of places because sort of traditional retail where you have to walk in the door and buy something in person, which never was a problem before necessarily, um, is, is not necessarily very disaster proof and really trying to think about our main streets and our vacant properties in a different way and think, thinking about how we support our business community in a different way. Um, we know that the pandemic obviously didn't have us just closed for 30 days. It had this just ripple effect. I call it a tornado. In some places, things were closed for a very long time and then partially open. In other places, they were closed for a shorter amount of time. And it really, it was very state dependent across the country. And so we're in a tough place to start, but I want to ground us a little bit in what that looks like, right? At the beginning of COVID, nearly every small business closed. Most people had never thought about needing this online offline combination as part of the nimbleness of their business. We had millions and millions of people file for unemployment last year, and we saw as jobs came back to the market, there was actually a growth in very low wage jobs or high wage jobs, but very little in the middle income jobs. Additionally, even before COVID, we saw this really significant decline in working age adult population in almost all of our counties. And so that means that there was something going on with the aging of the population, a brain drain of youth leaving a community, right? Or, or places just sort of decaying over time where we're having more and more of our smaller towns and cities um, really struggling for an economic reason to be there. And we know that having a vibrant main street and having a, a way to support our small businesses is essential to those outcomes. On top of that, we also, before COVID even, were recording the greatest income inequity that our country has ever recorded, which means that we're um, only having more and more of the have and have nots in our country. Um, and that vacant properties um, within our communities are just creating more and more of an issue um, in terms of the impact on um, property values, on sales revenue within a community as well. So we are at this transformational moment and it's not just because we're coming out of, well, we're sort of coming out of the pandemic, we're going back into the Delta variant. We're, we're in this transformational moment where we have in fact very little predictability, um, but we also have a significant amount of funding coming to our jurisdictions through the American Rescue Plan Act. And so that funding, which is outside the scope of how we usually spend any of our money, is this very unique moment to take a step back and say, what is our economic development strategy how do we make sure it's being it's benefiting the people in our community here and now? Um, and what does that mean in terms of investing in our people and our place? And to me, that it is a transformational moment to be able to build a strong and inclusive business community and really rebuild our local economy in a better way. So we know a certain a set of things, right? We know that people are looking for leadership and we know what success looks like, right? It's a downtown that brings people together, a place that people feel included and part of that success, a place that looks and feels cared for. And it creates this feedback loop where people want to be a part of that success. There's a lot of this research that, sorry, that is showing people that, things are moving in my room, um, that are showing people that, um, Soul of the Community is a study that was done a number of years ago, and it showed that people are really tied to a place because 
um, they feel included, there's places to gather, and there's some aesthetic beauty, either the natural environment or the built environment. And so when we start investing in those pieces, we create this positive feedback loop, not only of people putting their time in, but investment as well. So just briefly about me, um, you got a little bit of this at the introduction. Um, on the left, you can see a picture of me in a dress that my mother sewed for me. Um, my mother was a, a maker. She sewed, she knit, she crocheted, um, she painted, she, she cooked. Um, and uh, I only got a little bit of it. Um, she definitely made sure we all knew how to use drills and tools. Um, and on the right was an opportunity I had to give a TEDx talk called The Economic Power of Great Places, which is something I've worked on and, and focused on for a very long time. My other major project in the world are, are these kooky kids who, these are pictures are a little old now, they're definitely bigger than I am, um, where I also make sure that they know how to use the tools uh, in our lives. The work that I do with Recast City is focused on working with communities that see that small scale manufacturing businesses, which I'll tell you about in just a minute, um, can really be an economic asset. They can be an economic asset for Main Street and downtown, but they can also be an asset for building a more inclusive and a more resilient local economy that really does benefit the people who are there now. And I work with communities all over the country in doing this work and finding these businesses and understanding their needs. Um, usually. Uh, historically, it had been in person around a table, but obviously these days it's a lot more over Zoom that, or Google Chat than anything else. Um, but the thing that I think is, is important to think about with our economic development strategy, and this may not be true in your community, but it's still sort of dominant across the country, for, unfortunately, is that a lot of places are stuck in this default model. Um, and, and what I want to talk about today is also about thinking about how do we ditch this default model investing in a better way in our community and really figuring out how do we make it happen for our downtown, our main streets and the rest of our cities. Um, and so first, let me tell you a little bit about what, what it means to ditch the default model and, and what, what this model is that we need to leave behind. So we have um, a couple of elements that I just wanna walk you through. Um, and the problem with the default model is surprisingly enough, it's assuming one size fits all from economic development and it's not purposeful about who your community is, where your community is, and, and who are the people in it as well. So for the first issue is that it's really a, a model that's left over from the 80s, maybe even the 70s, but I like the excuse of putting an 80s hairband up. Um, there's a lot of things that we're doing that are sort of left over from this legacy of, of where we were in the 70s and 80s um, that is important to think about. And in fact, the, the way we're doing it is leaving a lot of people and places behind Partially it's because of this, the change in our, our sort of large scale industrial sector over time, but also it's because of the way we spend our money and who's benefiting from it. Um, when we create programs that are just first come first serve, or let me get this information out there and see what happens, um, the people who benefit are the people who are already in the know, most likely people who benefited from programs in the past um, and not expanding the opportunity for community wealth building. And so we're seeing more division and more extremes in income in our country than ever before, both a racial wealth gap, um, but also income inequity across the board. And then also the other thing we're seeing is this really weird dive towards what I call vanilla real estate. So it doesn't matter if you're talking about um, single family development or uh, mixed use like this. Um, we're seeing that a lot of things, they look like they're anywhere USA, and so they don't hold their value because there's nothing unique about them. Um, and that uniqueness, and this is something to remember, is really essential to what we're talking about. On top of that, we also build a lot of retail in this country. I, I call it expensive peanut butter. We sort of smeared it everywhere. And so it's important to think about how people come together, the, the sort of the nuance of where people want to come together and how we're putting retail in places or reinvesting in retail in places where that makes the most sense. So what do we do about all of this? Um, we invest in a better way, right? And none of this I think is going to be very surprising to you, especially if you're thinking already about main streets and about downtowns in your community. Um, we know that place is key to economic strength. When a place is invested in and it feels loved, I don't have a better term for it. Um, we there's the, it it creates that positive feedback loop and creates that economic strength. We also know that unique is key to that longevity. Um, people gravitate towards unique, both in your own community, but also when you travel. You people look for the unique downtown. 
Um, if there's a chain store in one town and a chain store in the next town, there's no competitive edge. It's that uniqueness around it that's really going to be the, 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 the competitive edge for that. And then we also know that social connections are gonna be key to economic resilience. And sometimes I feel like it's sort of weird to bring up the social connection side of it, but I think coming out of the pandemic this past year, it, people understand it maybe even more so. Um, the social connections is based on some research that was done after Katrina in Louisiana. And it showed that business owners who had strong social connections to other business owners were twice as likely to recover from the disaster than others who didn't have strong connections. And so we saw this past year, I imagine you saw it in your community, I'm in DC and I saw it there too, businesses that had strong connections with other business owners, they created these on the fly partnerships, they shared staff, they shared space, they, they did all of these different things just to make sure that they could survive this past year. Um, and so those social connections became even, even more important as an investment of time and resource. And I think is a really important thing for us to think about as we're thinking about economic development in our local communities. And yes, main streets and small scale manufacturing and all of these vitality things that we're talking about are a part of this as well. So we know that investment and growth can do good. We know that they're important. But the thing I talked about at the beginning, right, is that we need to int act with intention and purpose and really thinking about what outcome are we working to achieve and who should benefit from that. And I'll talk about those a number of times today. So our new path forward really needs to look a little different than the way we've done things in the past. It is really about investing in the people who live in our community now, investing in the place with those people creating a new structure to support and scale those investments and thinking long-term, but act now. And I love that the theme of the work that you guys are doing in the series is about acting now, because I believe that there are so many people in such dire need right now that yes, we need big long-term plans for some things, but there's so much that we can do in the next three to 12 months that can make a really big difference to these business owners and to our community that we can act on them now. And that's what I focus on in my work is the what we can do in the next three to 12 months. So speaking of acting on, um, we get to small scale manufacturing. So the question really is, who are these businesses and who are these owners and what do they mean? I call them my hidden gems, uh, the missing piece. You can, you can pick your own uh, nickname if you'd like. Small scale manufacturers are businesses that are in every single one of our communities. I've been all over the country in places big and small and they're there. These are businesses that are making some kind of tangible product. I know a lot of you are particularly interested in food product businesses, um, and that's one element of it, but it also can be hardware, even advanced manufacturing, or it can be artisans um, creating 10 or 20 of something. So it's this very wide scale. When I look at small scale manufacturing businesses, I'm generally looking at businesses that are up to 20, maybe 50 employees, because we're really looking at the size of business that fits into our community and fits into the fabric of our places. They provide us with a number of different benefits. Um, these businesses give us a reason to gather and they're really an amazing opportunity for us um, to be able to bring people together and to gather about, um, you know, see things that are being made in our community um, and be proud of those things. And we know that outdoor gathering right now is a great idea, but even bigger festivals will be coming back at some point as well. These businesses also help us build a more inclusive community of business owners. There are people who make stuff across every one of our communities, across every demographic. Um, it's a part of the history and the heritage of a lot of different cultures. And so when we start from scratch by building in a community of business owners that represents our demographic diversity, we are very purposefully building a more inclusive community, a more, more uh, di diverse leadership of who this is. Additionally, these businesses can fill our storefronts. Um, pr production and retail in one space works really well with modern manufacturing. They're quiet, they're clean, they're great neighbors, and it, it's experiential retail, right? You can look in the window, you can come in the store, and you can see something being made. Um, and that's, in fact, a draw. It becomes an amenity and that unique destination in your own downtown. This woman is a soap maker. She's got a big cauldron off to the side where she can mix her 
or soaps when maybe things are quiet in the store, pour them into the molds. Um, it's a cost efficient for her because she has one space. She has limited amount of staff needs because it's all in one space as well. Um, and she's energizing this storefront that maybe wouldn't be so energized otherwise. Additionally, as these businesses move into our vacant storefronts, they're increasing property value. They're creating that dynamic space. Zeke's is a coffee roaster. Um, the front of this shop is a coffee shop. The back of it is a roasting facility that does wholesale production that distributes to the whole region around it, right? We have, we have chocolate producers. This is in fact a phenomenal model for food product businesses because they can have that interaction with the community and have that small retail storefront, but they can do wholesale and not only sell um, within the community, but regionally and nationally, literally out their back door. And then we know that when we take care of our business owners, that begets us more business owners. It, in fact, helps us attract business owners when we take care of ours. Um, in Knoxville, Tennessee, they have the Knoxville Entrepreneur Center. That entity has a whole series of programming for maker businesses. They, they've, they actually have the website, The Maker City. Um, and so they... They are known, in fact, as a city at this point that is supportive of artisan businesses that want to scale, that want to be a, an active part of a community because of the care and feeding that they are providing for this business sector. In many ways, it's no different from what we've talked about with our tech sector in the past of how we're quite literally building a community of these people. Um, and we need to do the same thing with small scale manufacturing and product businesses. So yes, these are all pieces of a thriving place. And so the question that you might be asking is more specifically, who are these businesses? And I'm gonna walk through them really by size um, more than anything else, because to me, it comes down to the real estate. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but there's really three factors that are gonna make the biggest difference to support this sector. It's going to be business development support, the appropriate kinds of real estate, and capital finance. Um, and so just thinking about these three pieces as we go through um, and needing, you can have them at startup level and you can have them at scale up level. And most communities have never figured out how to do both of them. And so that's something we can talk about. So who are these businesses? First, we have the artisans, artisans, maker businesses. These are businesses that are one employee, maybe up to five. Um, they might be producing at home. They might be producing in a micro retail space, which could would be 700 square feet or 400 square feet, or even all the way down to 150 square feet. I promise there are examples of all of these things out there I can tell you about. Um, these businesses are producing goods predominantly by hand or with small machines. Um, Katie Stack uh, had a storefront and during COVID, in fact, gave up her storefront. And now she does production from home along with her employees also doing production from home in this distributed production model. Um, but as we're coming out of things and we're seeing storefronts being useful again, different size spaces become important. These businesses also can be vendors for your events, which is a really easy and very direct way to start engaging this business sector in your community. Um, and they also, uh, some of them are gonna be identified as businesses that wanna scale. And so are really sort of this, a real important base of the pyramid to build up within the pipeline of this business sector. And then we have folks who are doing prototyping or small batch production. They might be in advanced manufacturing, they could be creating certain kinds of hardware. Um, they could be doing small batch production where they're doing a hundred of something instead of 10 or 20 of something. And so these are businesses that are starting to scale. They might be five up to 20 employees. They can work really well in slightly larger spaces. Um, some of these may not be consumer facing. Some of them would want to be in older, small industrial properties, maybe not on Main Street, but on the back of Main Street. Um, but create all sorts of opportunities as well. Then we have folks that are doing production at scale in the neighborhood. These are businesses that maybe fit into an existing building, like this one is an old brewery building in Cincinnati in the brewery district, where a new brewery ended up buying the bill, rented and then bought the building um, so that they could expand. One of the things that I think is really interesting to notice about a lot of these businesses is that they're thinking about how to be the place where community comes together. Remember, I mentioned at the beginning, this is about creating places where people can gather and what that looks like um, and really building community. So um, from a zoning perspective, and we can talk about this if you want, we need to have the flexibility to both do production and retail, but also have events and programming in that space. 
Then we have different kinds of shared spaces. One kind of shared space is called a maker space. Maker space is generally focused more on education and outreach. Um, you get trained up on a tool or a set of tools and you can either pay for a specific class or you're gonna pay for a membership to have access to a whole set of tools. Um, these maker spaces are often focused, like I said, on education, but some of the larger ones also have programming for entrepreneurs and space for businesses to work there longer term um, in, in small spaces. Then we have shared production space that are in a specific vertical. Maker spaces are open to the public, so they can be um, people who are learning a skill, tinkering with something, or a small business, depending on the size and the purpose of that maker space. Shared kitchens or shared wood, wood shops or even share, shared metal studios are all specific to a vertical um, and only open to small businesses that are using that space. Commercial shared kitchens, we can come, we'll come back to, but they can be a really essential ingredient in not only uh, addressing things like a food desert, but empowering people in the community to start their own food-based business and really being part of uh, the solution of how we do that within the community. So what does this look like in an economy? I'm just gonna give you one example of a community I worked with. This is Columbia, Missouri. Um, this area doesn't look like a place you really want to spend any time, and I promise you, you wouldn't. Um, the, so four lanes, it's a pass-through, um, you know, buildings are fairly set back, uh, sidewalks are either very narrow or, or okay, but you certainly don't see anybody on the street. But the this area of property owners got together and created an improvement district themselves because they want to be more, they want to want to be a place. Um, we worked with them to bring people together, uh, brought the community together. We worked and met with property owners. We also met with small scale manufacturing business owners, which is a big part of our method to understand what are their needs? What, what's the outcome they want to achieve? What already works for them within the community, but what's missing also? And part of what we learned is that there was just this amazing amount of energy just under the surface in Columbia um, that nobody had ever paid attention to. And that sort of that phrase of them being overlooked is what we hear the most in our work in different communities, um, that it's there and it's chugging along and these business owners are just sort of head down making things happen um, and they're ready for support and they're ready to be involved and they're completely committed to the community, but nobody has ever engaged them before. Um, out of that project in particular, when we interviewed small scale producers in the community, both, both people who have spaces that they already lease and as well as home-based businesses is we found that there are a whole bunch of food product business companies um, that were home-based that were sort of bursting at the seams and they couldn't get um, their products into supermarkets unless they could move it to a commercial kitchen because it has a different health stamp level than the cottage food laws at home. And so we worked with them to launch a commercial shared kitchen on, on this same corridor um, that's mission driven, that's really focused on, uh, it's nonprofit, it's really focused on, on supporting uh, members of the community that really haven't been supported before, um, particularly black and brown business owners within the community, and, and is paired both a, a sort of a training and a technical assistance program with access to the space in the commercial kitchen. Um, and it launched in January, um, which was amazing that they still managed to launch it in COVID. Uh, they were only delayed by about six months because of it. And they had their official sort of grand opening only about a, a month or two ago um, and are, are filled with product, food product businesses working in this space now. The other thing that, that we worked with them to do is to change that zoning that I was talking about, creating the flexibility so that this area that I showed you has mixed use zoning, but it never would have allowed artisan industry as a, as a land use within it. And so we need to make sure that we at least can permit the thing that we wanna help create so that we have the flexibility that as investment happens along this corridor, we can create spaces for people to do work, do the production um, and create the presence of a place that people wanna be. So how do we make stuff happen? What are we doing with all of this? First, um, as you heard at the beginning, I have this book. I wrote a book. It's totally crazy. Um, the first 20 of you who registered, I hear, are going to get your own copy of the book. Um, but you can all check out uh, the first chapter for free at the book's website, readcastyourcity.com. Um, I'd love to know what you hear about the book. If you do get the whole thing, um, it is 
an a more in-depth in explanation of what's going on from an economic development perspective and why we need to do things differently. And it is a DIY. The whole second half of the book is about how do you do this work yourself? Um, and it comes with worksheets and, and, and lots of details to do this work within your own community. So I, I hope you all check it out. Um, but to me, it is all about taking action. So how do we create great places, save small businesses, and help support this business sector as a way to get there? There are a couple of steps that I want to bring up to you now as a way to just think about how to move forward with this, uh, even in the short term. One is thinking about how to create affordable space for diversity of small businesses. Sometimes the issue is affordability. Sometimes the issue is affordable space that's in a state of good repair. I know that in a lot of the smaller towns and cities that I've worked with, there are Main Street properties that people have honestly been squatting on for a long time and they're falling apart and nobody knows how to take care of them, how to wrestle control from who might own them. The owner might be multi-generational local and it's owned by so many different people in the family that they don't know what to, how to really bring it together anymore and create that legacy. It might be owned by somebody who's a distant property owner who really is neglectful of that property for tax reasons. And there are ways for us to solve for that, but the outcome we want to achieve is really making sure that we do have affordable and good repair space for a diversity of these small businesses, both as startups, but also as they're scaling. Second, we have to look at how we're filling in the gaps in assistance. And this is the capital and finance piece that I was talking about. Sometimes it's thinking about how we're doing the outreach. When we have financial assistance programs, who knows about it? Who are our partners that help spread the word? How do we have I call connectors across the demographics of our community to make sure that this information is coming to them from people that they, who they know and trust. Um, and sometimes that means partnering with a faith organization or neighborhood leaders or cultural groups to share that information and get it out there. Um, and sometimes it, there's an opportunity to do, to do micro grants instead of just loan programs and really thinking purposefully about who has missed out from these programs in the past and how do we make sure that we're investing in people and businesses that maybe didn't benefit from it in the past. The third thing to look at is local anchors. This can be the local government, it can be a school system, it can be larger businesses that are somewhere in the region, but they spend money and they buy stuff. Are there one or two things that they buy that they could buy within the local community. Who's the person at that company or that organization who makes that decision? How do we do quite literally one-on-one -on -one matchmaking with them? Or if there are things that they need that nobody's making in the community, how do we bring those needs to our community of small-scale manufacturers and say, if you can create a product at this level of quality, we have a ready buyer for you in the community and really think about how to get those dollars spent to create that feedback of spending in the community as well. Next, we need to think about our policies. Yes, that's gonna include zoning. It's also about permitting, occupancy permits. I can't tell you how many times those are the barrier, in, even if the zoning allows something, but really looking at how we allow things into our buildings. Um, what does the approval process look like? How much is it based on who you know versus something that's really laid out uh, in a document that people can see and understand? We wanna make it really easy for our businesses to get in the door and be able to settle into one of our buildings. And then lastly, it's really about promoting community pride. And I think in some ways this is even more important than it ever was before. We've all been through such a difficult year, year and a half at this point. We've lost so many lives in so many of our communities and we need to honor that in whatever way we can. Um, and, and I think that finding ways to bring the community together and express that pride of community is going to be even more important. Having events, having ways for people to come out together outdoors, having vendors that represent our community out there that people can be proud of are a really important part of that. Um, it's not just a strategy perspective for economic development. It's about helping people believe again in their community. And I think that's a really important thing to think about. So if you're ready to act, um, like I said, the, you can get the free chapter at recastyourcity.com. If you would like to connect with me on LinkedIn, you can just throw my name in there. Um, every great example I find from any other community or my and my stuff as well, all goes up on LinkedIn. It's probably the best place to find me. I am on Twitter and Facebook too, but, but LinkedIn is probably the best place to find me in all of this. Um, and I hope out of all of this, you, you've each taken at least one idea that you can take back to your community and take action on even within the short term. 
Because to me, this really is about creating the places where people can come together, where people appreciate what we're building and they appreciate what they see their, their neighbors creating and investing in, in our communities. Um, and, the, and the pride that people feel about having businesses um, that are creating things in our community, that are, that are paying better wages. I even skipped this over. Small scale manufacturing businesses on average are paying 50 to 100% more in wages as compared to retailer service jobs. So when we're looking at how do we pull people out of poverty or how are we breaking these cycles and really help build generational wealth within our community, this is one of the ways that we get there that we create these good paying jobs and we support the businesses that are creating good paying jobs within our community. And yes, it does take leadership. It takes standing up and saying, this is important to us and we are gonna set this as a priority. And that, that is sometimes a really hard step, but really important to do as well. So I think it's just important to remember this is about making great places that people are proud to call home. And that's what all of this work comes down to for me. So with that, um, you also can just email me if anybody has wants to reach out directly. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Um, but with that, I will uh, stop sharing and take any questions that you might have. Yeah, this is a great time to have some conversation. So I think that we're going to work through a few of these that popped up in the chat. Thank you all for, for contributing those. And, um, and then if we have some time, um, I'll ask you all to raise your hand and we might be able to get, uh, get a few folks asking questions verbally. That's kind of uh, unheard of, isn't it? But we're gonna give that a try. So um, Alana, thank you so much. Uh, I'd say this is a very inspirational message and it really does share um, some hope and a, a really a switch from the traditional economic development strategies that we've seen for the last 30 years. So thank you so much for highlighting some of these success stories in a very story oriented way that is, that is very tangible. So, you know, of course, where do we get started? So to elevate small scale production as a uh, economic development strategy, what do Virginia's community leaders, where do they need to start? So the first step is always figuring out what's the outcome you're trying to achieve. Is there a certain part of town that you want to benefit from this work? I always think of Main Street or downtown. Um, is a small scale manufacturing something that's important to you? And who should benefit from the work? That outcome and benefit are always our first step. And if you get the book, that's actually step one in the five step in the book. The second step is going out to find small scale manufacturing because we've never, in most communities, nobody's ever gone out to find them, to talk to them. There's no ready made database for you to use to go find them. So there's a whole set of steps that we take people through to go out and find their small scale manufacturing businesses. And then we have to talk to them. We have to talk to the, the business owners. We have to talk to the property owners. We, we, we have a whole process by which to get really new and honest information from people about what works and what doesn't work so that we can use that to inform our investments, right? We, we know that if it's a priority, we're going to invest in this sector in some way, right? It's going to be either in trainings or in some kind of real estate incentive or in capital, but we don't know which thing we need to do until we talk to the people in our community to understand their needs and then customize it to them. Yeah. The strong social connections are, it's such an important part to doing Main Street or, or any community initi initiative successfully. You have to have the people at the table. Now, you know, often we see that it's that STP situation, the same 10 people that, that are, are present. And, and this isn't to diminish them. They're fantastic leaders and they're there for a reason. Hopefully, you know, the community seeing results due to their passion, but you know, it, it can be a very difficult uh, topic to bring up that the uh, diversity in general. So how how can our leaders start a conversation about inclusivity and and attending to that racial wealth gap? We do it by action. It, when we build the list of small scale manufacturing businesses in a community, we work really hard with the community to make sure that that list represents the demographic diversity of that place. When we go out and we do interviews with business owners, we're being very purposeful about who we're talking to and making sure that we're reaching whatever the divides are in that community, we're reaching across those divides because we have this common purpose that we're focusing on. And we, it's important for us to understand that there might be barriers that some community faces that others don't. 
Um, yeah. And we want to understand those differences. And so it's not about saying we need to create an inclusive program. It's about going out and being inclusive in the way we are building the program. So um, it is really all through action, um, which in many ways I think is easier once you get the sort of the direction to say, I mean, I've, I've worked with a lot of communities where I, they'll make an initial list of, of small scale manufacturers and it won't represent their demographic diversity. And I will give them the follow-up assignment, which is in fact how I work with people. It's a partnership of information of saying, great, now go add the people who that, re that represent the demographic diversity. We have a whole method behind how to do that. Mm -hmm. The challenge is what I call network bias. You know the same 10 people, right? Everybody has their network that they know. And it's in fact very hard for most people to break out of their personal network. It takes very purposeful steps. And so part of what we have is a set of steps to help people identify new connectors in the community or new to them um, who are known and trusted um, within their, their specific population, their community, who believe in the future of, of, of the broader city or, or town um, and get them engaged in helping to do that outreach. It's nothing one person can do by themselves. It really is a team effort. Yeah, and 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 uh, really making that a part of the, um, the 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 strategic plan for an organization or for a municipality. That kind of outreach often gets neglected for um, other more sort of immediate or greater um, responsibilities that might generate more jobs. Often people steer away from those more social capital oriented activities that do create those uh, kinds of connections because they don't immediately create that um, tangible outcome that you know a municipality or just a community really needs um, but it's an important part to be in, in um, to, to add that intention into the work that you do is what I'm hearing and I'm so happy to hear that you have some tools about how to navigate through that um, and it makes me think of, and it's probably related to some of the community heart and soul work of doing a community network analysis, really taking the time to uh, understand the demographics of your community and then think systematically through, okay, uh, who are the groups that represent uh, these, this demographic diversity? Who are the leaders a part of that? How do we contact them? How do we communicate with them and really develop some intentional methods in order to reach them? Would you say that that mirrors a little bit of uh, um, what, what uh, you've um, outlined within your book? Yes, but the caveat I would give you is that it's not in no way, at no point in my work are we trying to map out the entire network. We're really, it's all tactical. It's all, yeah. let's find enough people to do enough of this to get an understanding. Um, mm -hmm. Just like when we do a full market analysis, um, it sometimes gives us such broad information that it's hard to act on things sometimes. So this is all with an outcome and a purpose as the focus of it. So we're looking at connectors to target populations within our community that can make introductions, that can help us bring these business owners together. Um, so I don't want anybody to feel like there's this sort of this big network mapping that we do because we don't. Yeah. Um, um, it's very sort of taking advantage of whatever knowledge we can pull out of people's brains quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, when we work one on one with a community, we do all of this in four months, soup to nuts um, to, to set of recommendations. Um, when we train people on how to do this themselves, it's part of a cohort program that goes for 12 months. But it really takes people a while to sort of chew, I don't have a better word, chew through their existing relationships and sort of take that next step out and, and build real new relationships with people over coffee or over a phone call if you can't be in person or Zoom, um, where they have, we have new connections to people. Yeah. Are there any activities from the communities that you've worked with that really, um, that really uh, generated those those kinds of results of those community connections. I'm curious about maybe some stories or something very specific that was done that reaped those kinds of uh, that social capital that's needed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of it is about bringing people together in different ways. So when we worked with Knoxville, Tennessee, a bunch of years ago, they were running a startup program. And the, urban, the Knoxville Urban League was running a startup program. They called them different kinds of programs. One was for lifestyle business. One was for technology-enabled businesses. 
they were training a lot of the same people and there was really mostly just a racial divide between these two programs. And so once we got them together and got them to see that they were doing something in fact very complementary and overlapping, they started working together on these programs and um, the Knoxville Entrepreneur Center could very purposefully step into a new partnership with the Knoxville Urban League so that the next year when they did a maker summit, which they were doing annually, they, were, they could very purposely highlight um, makers of color um, within the community to really showcase the stories of these business owners. Thank you. So I want to dig into say a little bit more of the technical side of things. This relate a little bit more uh, towards the questions that are showing up in chat. So there's a good story about Powhatan County here in Virginia that recently adopted a new amendment that caters to small scale food producers. And um, so curious about some of those tips uh, or insights on how to advocate for zoning that's uh, conducive to small scale producers and even the things that are barriers possibly maybe to touch on first. Well, I mean, I think it's important to have a definition either for artisan manufacturing or in this case, a small scale food production. Um, some of those definitions include maximum square footage. Some of them don't. Um, we generally like to see a, a, the biggest, the widest definition as possible. Um, you know, more or less saying that it can't create any external noise or fume that's greater than anything else that's already allowed in that zone. Um, we had discussions with somebody once with a zone where like dog kennels were already allowed in that zone, which is so noisy, but people were worried about artisan manufacturing going into that same place. And I was like, you're not going to have anything louder than what's already there. Um, so thinking about that, but then also thinking through the permitting process. So when we did this with Fairfax County, Virginia, we took three scenarios of a real building um, with three actually real businesses that we, you know, sort of made anonymous and we laid them out even in a sketch in this real building and gave it to everybody in the permitting process to say okay now this land use is allowed in commercial buildings how would you take it through the permitting process because that's a really hard set of questions there's a lot of definitional work that has to happen on the permitting process with fire and with health and with all sorts of other stuff um and in reality we the start of it was just them asking a lot of questions that they realized that they needed to answer. And so taking them through a couple of scenarios, you know, one chocolate factory or a shared, you know, production market, or I can't even remember what the third one was right now. Um, but how do we make sure that these different kinds of models can work in the space? We really have to take the scenario through all of that so that we understand where those existing barriers are. Um, occupancy permits can often be an, a, just an enormous barrier for getting people into the space, sometimes because of the sort of the optics of it depends on who you talk to in the community and what questions they're going to ask and the lack of predictability, sometimes because the delay in an occupancy permit is just so long. And so we want to make sure that we're streamlining the process as much as possible for people who are doing really what we want in the places we want them to be. So you really have to have that language in the code. It has to be very specific, and but then also have some um, uh, some 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 information out there that helps a a business owner to navigate it or a developer to navigate it as easily as possible. Some sort of developer's guide or a step by step instruction on a web on uh, the Main Street organization's website or their municipal website. Right. And some well, one of the things we found with Fairfax County was if they had, I'm not going to get the number right, if they had eight chairs instead of 12 chairs, you know, at 12 chairs, it, it kicked into the county's health code. And at eight chairs, it was statewide. There were some like these weird lines that nobody knew was there. So if you had a, a food product business, but you wanted people to be able to get a couple of bites at that place, there were these really specific lines you had to walk, but nobody knew about them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um. I want to get into incentives a little bit here. What kinds of incentives for small scale producers have the most impact? And, and I'm curious both uh, for the, so the essential ones, the ones that really need to be in place, but then are there any that are a bit more advanced that may be a little progressive that you don't see very often that um, should be considered as well? Yeah, I mean, all of the work is gonna focus on those three things I was talking about. Some business development support, real estate and capital. And um, there are different things you can do as startups and as scaling up businesses. 
Um, you know, I think the, the, the easiest and the, the first incentive is also is first is identifying these businesses and having them building them in some capacity into a, a community of business owners and having them see each other and, and, and giving them answering what their direct needs are. Um, the other major thing is making sure that there is appropriate space for them as they start and scale um, within the community in a way, in a place that's where they want to be. That's the price point where they can be. Um, and, and the training, the startup training or the scale up training that's out there is often geared towards tech businesses or service businesses and product businesses have a whole different thing around pricing of their product, e-commerce distribution. There's just nuances to it that they need separate help for. And so finding the right technical program for them to support. If you guys haven't checked out 37 Oaks, they're a phenomenal program that has a lot of training. They're out of Chicago, but they have a lot of recorded on-demand uh, programming as well. Well, guess what? Durand is, uh, she's going to be speaking next month. So. Oh, right. Durand <laughs> is coming to you guys. Even yeah. better. You guys will hear it directly from her. She's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, hey, love it. You're queuing you know, them up already. <laughs> um, well, and then you have Bach on the on the podcast, which is also fantastic. So, you know, the other incentive is thinking about from a property owner perspective, what kind of incentive can you create for property owners to, to create space for them? Um, so um, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. For new development, you could create, if you were in a big enough community, you could create a density bonus where people could get, you know, developer could get added density, commercial or residential, if they dedicate a certain amount of the ground floor to locally owned businesses or micro retail spaces. Mm -hmm. um, the micro retail project in DC that I think is most exciting is called Artwalk. And that was a negotiation between the developer uh, and the city where they created a series of um, micro retail spaces, 400 square feet to about 700 square feet within the ground floor of this residential building. The upstairs is high end and it quite literally um, subsidizes the cost of that ground floor space, but it was a 30 year commitment of the developer to the city to keep these spaces, these micro retail spaces at below market rates. So there's some really exciting real estate models that are going out there. Where might our listeners find information about those models? Is, is there a go-to place that you know of? I mean, other than my website? Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. I mean, I have a blog. If you sign up for any of my things, you get you end up on the email list, you'll get the blogs. Um, I really work hard to make sure that you get the best of. LinkedIn is, in fact, where I share dynamically whatever new best model I see, it goes up on LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. So that's... Um, that's really where, where I would recommend. Um, there's, you know, and there's examples in Virginia that you can track down as well. So um, I do find sometimes the homegrown examples are going to be the best of. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we started a um, pilot program for small scale production here in Virginia to really explore in regions, uh, in larger cities, in, in our rural communities some ways to, uh, well, explore the assets that might help to um, generate more small scale production businesses, but then developing a program out of that that uh, may get the results that they're looking for. And that was working with Main Street America. One of the, the issues that we found is that there are a lot of um, you know, communities that have their incubators and um, have their hatcheries and, and resources for the startup side of things. But, but what was missing is really the scale up and, and finding some assistance. What works, what have you seen work in that realm or programs that help to direct um, very targeted assistance to scale up uh, small scale manufacturing business? I think it's sort of fascinating that, that we as a country are sort of are ob somewhat obsessed with startups versus scale ups. Yeah. Um, startups are the highest risk investment, right? I don't even remember the stat, but it's something like 80% of startups aren't there. We're even bigger. Some crazy stat about startup, the number of startups that aren't there five years later. Um, so I always focus on existing businesses who's already making a product that they're selling. Right. When we go and look at small scale manufacturing and community, we're looking at who's there, who are these business owners, what are they making, not who wants to create a business. We'll get there, but it's not where we're going to start. So I always start by focusing on our existing business owners. They have a product that they're creating. They have figured out how to sell it in some way, maybe not at the right price point, but they're figuring out how to sell it in some way. They've figured out their supply chain and distribution, at least to some degree. 
And so that means to me that they are a much lower risk than somebody who has an idea for a widget versus somebody who's making a widget and distributing it. So I always start with our existing producers and they're everywhere. There's plenty of them. Um, at that point, it's it's sort of the same thing. They need a certain level of training. Um, you can ask Tarand about it when she comes on the show next week. Um, I introduced her to South Bend, Indiana, and she did a phenomenal program with a cohort of existing product businesses in South Bend called Scaling Up South Bend, um, where she took existing product business owners and provided them with a training about how do you take your work, think about your pricing, think about your revenue, and really figure out how to scale your production and your revenues in the way that you're doing it so that our businesses are stronger, right? We want our businesses to be more resilient, especially our existing ones. And then thinking about what kind of space do people need to scale? Are they home-based businesses and they might need a subsidized space for the first six or 12 months? Um, do we need a shared production space, not necessarily with shared tools like a makerspace or a commercial shared kitchen, but a building where somebody can get 500 square feet and be next to another producer with another 500 square feet? You can check out uh, a, a space in Dallas called Tyler Station. Um, that is a whole building of that. Um, and so there, there's a lot, of, and Bach is in fact very much that. So you, there's a lot of different ways to create spaces for these businesses as well um, as, as a focus on our scaling up businesses. Hmm. Thank you, this is good. Um, I'm gonna see if we have some people that might wanna raise their hand to ask a question um, versus typing it in. So um, feel free to hit that little hand down in the bottom center and uh, I will call on you to unmute. But while, uh, before I get to that, um, there was a question by Jessica here that she said, you mentioned a podcast. Can it's you share your that? podcast. Was it our podcast that was Your mentioned? podcast. I oh, mentioned, yeah. I yeah. mentioned the, the podcast. You guys are going to have Jessica, Jessica, right, from Bach yeah. on your podcast this month? Yeah. Okay. That's the one. Yes. So our podcast, and I'll tell you more about that at the very end as we close things up. But Catherine, thank you. That's the Partners for Better Communities podcast uh, that DHCD produces. Our own uh, Doug Jackson. He's amazing. Um, so for those who would like to ask a question in per a person, feel free to hit that little hand and uh, we'll, I'll, I'll call on you and you can unmute and ask your question uh, directly. So um, let's see. Might there be anything left on my list of questions that might help uh, um, with, let's see, I feel like I've kind of worked through all my stuff at this point. Um, I mean, the thing I, I would say in, in just thinking about this with folks is to, it to really, um, implore you is, is probably still not even a strong enough word for me, um, is to think about what do you, what, what is that outcome? Be really specific. And when I work, when I talk to people about it, I say, here, take my magic wand, wave the magic wand and tell me exactly what it's like to walk down that road on a wet, on a Saturday at three or a Wednesday at six and, and describe it to me. And, and, and if you, if you see the book, you'll see, I don't, it's not a wonky book, even though it is in fact pretty wonky work that we do. Um, it's, it's, I write in a, and I talk in a way that is really about how are we including people in this discussion? And so the more that you and your teams can describe what you want that place to be like, what is it like when you walk in a storefront, who gets to have the business in that storefront, right? A question we've never asked on main streets before. Um, what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve and who should benefit from that? And the more specific that we can be about who should benefit from those investments, because whatever it is we're doing, will take some kind of investment. It might be monetary, it might be time, it might be political capital. Who we want to benefit from it, the more specific we can be, the more likely, likely we are to succeed. And I know it's super political and sometimes very hard to be explicit about who we want to benefit from it, but I think we owe it to our communities at this point because there's, as you know, so much need and so much we need to do. Um, and that really taking the time to go out and build this broader network and build access to these small scale manufacturing business owners is the way to change the future. All the other ways we've been doing things is like sort of the quick hit, not permanent, you know, not long-term resilient set of solutions. Um, and I think honestly, we're way past the time that we owe it to ourselves and our communities to be doing these things in a more, in a deeper way. 
yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree with you. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Everyone pre- really put some time uh, into, um, you know, fostering your networks and your relationships for your organization, for your municipality, for the nonprofits that are doing this work. You know, that's a pipeline of donors. That's a pipeline of volunteers. That's obviously a pipeline of the people that you'll be serving. So really put some time and creativity into the way that you nurture that, that network. Um, oh, this is amazing. And I, I think people have maybe have too much food in their mouths. They're not really willing to, to unmute and talk. So it is afternoon. So um, I'm going to share some things here that uh, uh, to start moving towards closeout. But I, I really want to thank you, Alana. This is amazing. Really great conversation. Um, very timely information and uh, great opportunities uh, for our um our, our communities across Virginia. So thank you so much for, for being here today and uh, making time to talk with everybody. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, let's see. Uh, you really got everybody thinking about the potential of small scale manufacturing to transform our economy. So um, lots to think about there for everybody. Um, Let's see, you can find information about the Creative Community Vitality Series on virginiamainstreet.com. So that's where you can get to that podcast that you're looking for, Jessica, where you can also learn about downtown best, uh, downtown management best practices, local stories, funding opportunities, and upcoming events across the Commonwealth. So sign up to receive posts in the bottom right-hand corner of the landing page. Also upcoming on August 16th is a podcast with Lindsay Spanapico. Hopefully I got that right, Lindsay. Managing partner of Scout, a design and development firm that transforms vacant and underutilized spaces in creative ways. And in September, September you will fo- we will focus on workforce and entrepreneurs in a webinar with Queen of Local Commerce, Taran Smith, who strengthens communities by preparing women and minority-owned businesses for the diverse growth and an inspiring podcast with Jennifer Vey of the Bass Center for Transformative Placemaking. And let you know that you've got some local assistance out there too. If you have any questions, please reach out to DHCD's Community Revitalization Office staff. Contact information and tons of community building resources are available on DHCD's website and Virginia Main Street's blog. So hyperlinks are active in the webinar handout as well. So make sure that you snag that. But thank you to everybody for being here and making time. Enjoy your lunch. Can't wait to see you all next month. Uh, for the next series. And Alana, take care. I can't wait to dive into your book. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Take care, everybody.